Good morning. It's uh, January 4th. The year is 2001. I'm here. My name is Barbara Slavin, and uh, we're doing the Veterans Oral History Project at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. We're interviewing John Ray. We've interviewed Mr. Ray uh, four other times. We have four uh, roughly chronological tapes on his uh, military experiences. And the reason we did so many was because he has such a long and distinguished military career from his service in the field artillery in North Africa and Europe uh, to his uh, service in Korea and also his service uh, teaching at West Point, teaching law at West Point and also um, his work with the uh, Field Artillery Battalion at the Nike Missile Defense in New York. One thing that uh, we touched upon briefly here and there in his previous interviews was his experiences uh, being taken as a prisoner of war, a prisoner of war and being released. Uh, and we'd like to concentrate on this interview strictly on his experiences as uh, his uh, several, at least two, uh, three, depending on how you look at it, experiences as a prisoner of war in uh, North Africa and in Europe. So good morning. Sorry for the long introduction. Could you tell me uh, about your first experience uh, being taken prisoner of war? May I first say, Barbara, yes. that it's an honor to be here <laughs> with you and Bob. Thank Did you. you know that St. Barbara is the patron saint of, artillery. of the field artillery. That's how I got my name. My That's father gave me my name based That's on good. that. Surely. So how about your first um, experience? I was captured twice, once in Tunisia, North mm -hmm. Africa, in uh, 1943, in March of 43, mm -hmm. and a year and a half later as an entirely separate matter, I was captured a second time in the Battle of the Bulge in December of 44. I just want to make clear they're right. really quite entirely separate experiences. Mm -hmm. In 43, in March, uh, uh, the American forces had been uh, uh, seriously hurt in Kasserine Pass, as we've talked about in the earlier interviews but recovered under the leadership of General Patton and uh, later of General ba uh, Omar Bradley. And uh, having recovered, it was time to destroy Rommel and his forces mm -hmm. in Bizerta during the month of uh, April of 43, March and April of 43. I, I had performed most of my functions uh, on behalf of General Bradley and uh, his forces uh, by early March of 43, which had to do with munition supply mm -hmm. for his forces, which would, which would be attacking Bizerta. Mm -hmm. And having extended myself perhaps uh, maybe a little bit too much uh, physically and so forth, General Bradley saw fit to give me a couple of days off I had done my job, which was a logistics job. I was not really a fighting soldier. I was in logistics. And he gave me a couple of days off uh, to rest before the attack on Bizerta. And it was uh, my unfortunate, or perhaps uh, uh, we might just say uh, regrettable, uh, fortune to be captured by the Germans uh, near the town of Matur M-A-T-E-U-R in Tunisia uh, while I was uh, simply in a <laughs> on a day off. I was, I was doing nothing important or significant. I was not destroying Germans that day. <laughs> I had done my business a couple of days before for that purpose. And with my driver, a young man called Private Stobach, from Mount Vernon, New York, Storbach and I, uh, we ran head on into a German uh, uh, roadblock and uh, our Jeep was destroyed and we were both captured. When you say your Jeep was destroyed, what, what happened? Uh, I, I guess it was they fired at us by uh, uh, small arms fire, rifle fire, which disabled the vehicle and Storbach lost control of it, it kind of tipped over in a ditch. 
do you think they were intending to kill you or to capture you? I'd say probably kill. Mm -hmm. killing, killing the enemy is a better thing to do than capturing. You capture, you capture trouble, especially if you capture John Ray. <laughs> so tell me about the capture itself. Well, it's a, there was not very much to it. Here's two young fellows in a disabled Jeep. We really are not hardly armed. We probably each had a carbine with us and nothing more. We're pretty much helpless. It's just a matter that one or two Germans come and take charge of us and uh, march us uh, uh, to a position of relative safety. Maybe that's what I should get into next. Uh, we, we had to go from this position to whatever would be a holding area for prisoners. This is just too little us. And so uh, we were in the Atlas Mountains of uh, North Africa there. And uh, there was a lot of uh, activity on both sides of the line, that is American and German. And we found ourselves being taken over a mountain pass to go back to what would be uh, a temporary prison camp. And as we went there, we found ourselves under American artillery fire. Those very fellows whom I had been supplying with the bullets, the big bullets, were firing at us, if you get the picture. <laughs> so we're going over a mountain pass. There were probably one or two other small groups of captured Americans or British that were in similar situations. And we were with German forces, the American forces, were firing at us, not knowing, of course, that we were there, at least I don't think they do, and they were <clears throat> firing their artillery fire in a fashion which was my professional business, you might say, so I understood what the firing techniques were and all, and the, uh, a very small number of Germans, and only a very small number of us prisoners, were, were being marched in a uh, narrow mountain uh, uh, pass. We were required after a while to, uh, Staubach and I, to uh, carry uh, uh, wounded Germans on litters or stretchers, if you will, and we carried these one man at a time is all we could carry, of course, uh, over the mountains to a, a position of safety. and. It's not exactly too easy to picture, I don't suppose. You're under artillery fire coming in. You're carrying German uh, wounded. If you have a heart, which most American soldiers, I believe, have, they want to protect the, the uh, wounded man on the stretcher, even though he's a German. And uh, well, in short, it was a pretty busy day that day and a pretty exciting day particularly for me in that I, I knew the guys who were firing at us from a distance of a, uh, several miles away. I, I say I knew them in the sense that these are battalions of artillery are firing in that direction. I'm not suggesting we were their only target. There were numerous uh, uh, targets the Americans were firing at. And it just was our good luck that uh, we were not uh, uh, wounded or killed, in fact, by the, our own troops firing. I say it was to my benefit that I knew their firing techniques and so was able to anticipate whether the next volley would be over or short of the last one and be able to make, uh, uh, to take some actions which might uh, uh, save our lives and it turns out we were not hurt. Let me ask what your rank was at the time you were captured? I was a major. And what were you wearing? You say it was a day off. What were you wearing at the time that you were captured? Oh, he wore a uniform all, all war. All the time. Except okay. I, at the time the Jeep, Jeep was uh, uh, damaged in the ditch, I immediately removed all insignia. Mm -hmm. The Germans had no knowledge of my rank, and I uh, did not inform them of the same. We've often heard that you should give the enemy your name, rank, and serial number. Why did you not want them to know your rank? Because I felt that a you know major is a fairly high right. rank, and they might 
see fit to hurry me to Germany. I didn't have any desire to go to Germany till we were the winner. When you had the wounded uh, Germans, were you communicating with them and consoling them in any way, or talking to them? Not with those patients, no, yeah. they, were, they were out of it. Oh, okay. So tell me what happened next. You're transporting the Germans. Well, we, uh, we, we got to some place that was uh, uh, safe enough, I guess, that we no longer were under uh, American fire, and we were brought to a schoolyard in uh, the city of Tunis, just to look very much like what could have been an American schoolyard, mm -hmm. and that became our prison for a certain uh, limited period. My memory as to just how long we were there is unclear. I would say that it was something a little short of a month in this uh, schoolyard. There were not a great many of us. We were American, we were British, we were French, and certain of the uh, uh, lesser allied nation uh, had uh, men in there in prison. It was a very informal kind of a setup. You can just picture an American school, uh, elementary school yard being converted to a prison. It wasn't very different looking from that. And uh, mind you, the German forces, Rommel's forces, knew that they had had their, they had lost the game. It was over. The, the war in North Africa was over except cleaning up the mess at this time. Uh, it was still on, but I mean the, the, the fate of Rommel's forces was very clear. When, uh, did they separate you from the, um, the rank and file prisoners? No, not, not at this early uh, uh, place in the long chain of prison uh, control. When you were captured uh, and you were in the schoolyard in the city of Tunis, did you have a, 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 an idea that you might be a prisoner for years? Uh, well, I suppose that was a possibility. <laughs> it was an undesirable possibility. The idea would be to uh, let's get out of this situation. I don't want to. I was 24 years old at this time, I think I was. And, uh, you know, I don't want to spend my war in there and so the idea would be we, we, I don't want to go back to Germany then I'll know I'm, I'm going to be stuck there maybe for years <clears throat> we must some way get out of this well <clears throat> at a certain point mind you there, there were something less than 200 prisoners in this camp uh, at this time in the schoolyard and one day the uh, prison commander informed us that we were all being shipped to Germany that afternoon. Well, since I was the senior person in the camp, uh, which for some reason or other was something that happened to me time and again, I was <laughs> always that, even at such a tender age, and it meant that I was placed by the Germans in a certain minor position of authority mm -hmm. over the other uh, allied prisoners. In other words, if the Germans needed to, to speak to the 200 prisoners, they speak through me. Mm -hmm. That's uh, at the moment is I'll, maybe you'll get the feel of this after a while. So the uh, German leader designated a German non-commissioned officer to march us from the schoolyard to the port where we would be put into uh, ships and sent across the Mediterranean to Italy and in turn to Germany. <laughs> this German non-commissioned officer, sergeant, uh, needed somebody to deal with the men through and that was me. We had 169 or so men in this column that were to march to the port through the city of Tunis, a pretty good sized city, <laughs> and so I marched beside the German so uh, uh, sergeant who was in charge of the column. We're going through the city in broad daylight and our column was attacked by American and British bombers. I don't know what height they may, altitude they may have been at, I don't know, they were pretty high, but it was a very uncomfortable uh, position to be in where the city is already busted up, busted buildings, rubble, and we're marching uh, through the city and uh, 
uh, these American and British bombers came come over bombing the column. It's a very uncomfortable and dangerous situation. I told the German sergeant, you have no business doing this. You're violating the Geneva Convention when you do this. You cannot require us to march under such cover. He said, but what can I do about it? He said, I think that you, and I said, I think you must do something to give us protection. He said, what should we do? I said, I think you should place me in charge of the formation. <laughs> he said, that's what I will do. Yeah. And we continued to march. I simply marched backwards myself, faced my men, and I said at my next command, the command is going to be to disperse. I don't want to see any of you again until we are back in New York or wherever else in the USA. Is that clear? No question. Disperse. This was my order and it was obeyed. The 169 men, I have yet to see any of them since, with the exception of Lieutenant Bill Ely, who was kind of my partner in crime. What did the Germans, what do you think the Germans thought of your dispersing the what did they think about it? Yeah. I really was not interested, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, there it was. We were gone. And uh, they went, and I never did see any of them again. I think they probably, mostly, got back safely to the American lines. Can we backtrack a little? I wanted to sure. ask you questions about uh, daily prison life. What was your, when you were there in the schoolyard in Tunis, in the prison, uh, as a prisoner, what was your daily life like? <clears throat> Everything was very informal, disorganized, and whatnot. Please uh, understand, this is not like a really established camp, like I will tell you about later on when we're in Germany, where it's an established camp, a, a very different situation. In this case, everything is kind of uh, uh, ad hoc, or however you might, you might say it. Uh, nothing was very organized. <coughs> I felt that it was my duty, both then and in the later events that we'll talk about later, that it was my responsibility to do things to maintain the morale of the troops, mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the other prisoners. This would be to represent them in their needs for food, or their needs for cleanliness, or for clothing, or whatever it might be, that it was my job as kind of like a scoutmaster or something like this to carry the, the requirements of my men to the Germans, mm -hmm. even though I know I'm probably not going to succeed, but if they need better food or more water or soap or whatever it is, I must help them to do that. Now, it's also, I feel, my responsibility in there, and everybody's responsibility for that matter, to cause as much trouble for the Germans as possible to cause them as much inconvenience. If the man says to you, how much do you weigh? I say, sorry, I've forgotten. You'll have to weigh me. Mm -hmm. Which means you've got to get a scale. You got to do this. You know that he is bureaucratic because he's German. So he's got to go to great effort maybe to go get a scales and do more different things. Maybe not a very good example, but uh, uh, other things like that are done to cause either confusion or uh, extra work for the so-called detaining power. This is what you call the, the, the Germans, the detaining, detaining power. power. How was the food? I'm sorry? How was the food? And there was so little of it, Barbara, in yeah. those days that I can hardly even remember. Yeah. But the period was not very long, like a month. I consider that to be rather short. Any one of us, especially uh, myself today, would do pretty well to go hungry a few weeks anyway. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the food was not a serious matter in this short-term period. Mm -hmm. I think we'll probably talk more about that, about the German food German. later on. The quality of the food really stunk. It was poor. The, the, the bread was a very uh, heavy, dark bread that uh, mm -hmm. obviously was uh, not very well made with a lot of heavy sediment in the bottom. There was uh, coffee made. I thought from acorns. I'm not sure whether that's correct or not, but it was certainly not made from coffee. Uh, actually, beyond that, in the, as far as the food in the African camp is concerned, I have not very much recollection, except food was, there wasn't much of it. Did you sleep on a cot or on the floor? <laughs> uh, well, 
it would have been something less than a cot. Less it may cot, be we yeah. had some kind of straw mat or yeah. something like that. And how, what, can you give me, tell me what your dealings were like with the German officers? There was but one German officer in that little camp. Mm -hmm. 169 is a small number of mm -hmm. prisoners. We had only one officer as far as I can recall, and he himself was kind of a carefree fellow, red-headed guy, who he told me he was from Chicago. Now, uh, you can believe what you want from the Krauts, <laughs> you can also believe what you want from me. <laughs> That's what he told me, and uh, I'm, uh, it doesn't surprise me to tell you that, because uh, I suppose it could have been true. He spoke good English. Yeah. Uh, now, you see, I got as far as the dispersal of these yes. fellows. Now, it was only Lieutenant Ely and I are the only ones left. The other 167 have disappeared. What happens to Ely and me? We hid in the, in the broken rubble of broken building okay. for three days, just the two of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, at a certain point, after about three days, we agreed that this was kind of a hopeless situation. It's getting pretty hungry around here. It's getting pretty, uh, pretty uh, dry and thirsty. And uh, uh, I think we've just had enough of sitting around in, in this place. Let's see if we can't make our own way back to the American lines. All the time, you realize, Barbara, we uh, expect this war to be ending in Africa, like any minute. Yeah. There's no use sacrificing your life uh, in order to get uh, uh, killed here and the war's going to end tomorrow, like. Yeah. I say the war, you understand what I, I mean, the North African War in 1943. So in any event, we decided early one morning at probably 5 a.m. or so in April, it was uh, uh, daylight pretty much, we decided to just get out of our little hole that we had uh, hiding in the, in the rubble and to walk straight out and see if we could walk to the American line. The next thing, we were walking past what I was called at times Rommel's Pentagon in, in, in Tunis. Here it is five, six, seven o'clock in the morning. We're walking past here. Here's German officers coming to work as though they're in the Pentagon. Uh, walking to work, and here's two grubby little American prisoners, uh, probably very uh, crummy looking. What were you wearing? Well, probably a shirt and trousers it is mm -hmm. about all that we were wearing. We hadn't shaved probably for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Not that I carry a heavy beard or anything, but we were just grungy looking. We salute the German officers as we went past. They didn't pay any attention. We walked uh, on through the city, right past Rommel's headquarters, through the city, and on out of town until we felt we were now out in the suburbs and looks as though we may be able to get uh, home free. You obviously oh. were not in uniform. You obviously were not in uniform. You were wearing civilian we were clothes. In, we were in shirt and trousers of military uniform. Oh, how did they not know you were American? Well, because almost every nation's yeah. uh, shirt and trousers uh, have approximately the oh, same, okay. same look, not, yeah. not very much. Yeah. Uh, maybe they even did know and didn't yeah. care. Yeah. Uh, how can I de develop the tension of the mm -hmm. battle from their point of view right. as well as our own? So here's a couple of grungy Americans going by. Is it important? Maybe no. Yeah. And we barely get outside to the uh, suburbia of town. and. Here comes along a little Italian tank. Mm -hmm. <coughs> pink, it was painted, because the Italians like to paint their tanks uh, pink to match the desert, uh, right. something or other like that. And uh, so these Italian boys on the tank, looking very much like uh, Italian Americans we might be seeing in Boston or Brooklyn, and they kind of spotted us. They stopped their tank and spoke to us in English and said, what are you guys doing here? Something like this. <laughs> and uh, it turned out, I, I only want to make light of it because it was light. The Italian soldier was, uh, at least as we saw him in North Africa, was a pretty light-hearted fellow. And he, uh, the next thing we were talking about the Brooklyn Dodgers and such as that, uh, with these guys on the tank. And uh, there was a bit of playfulness about all this. And the next thing they got serious and said, 
come on board. Oh. You've been captured again, brother, oh. or words to that effect. They picked us up, put us up on, the, on their tank, and took us right back to the same school. And now we're the only two prisoners in the schoolyard, Ely and me. Well, <laughs> the prison commander, this red-headed guy from Chicago, he was really furious. What are you doing here? <laughs> I shipped you out. I said, well, yeah, you tried, but it didn't work. And I, he said, you are to go, and you're going to be put this time in solitary confinement. And I said, you cannot do this to an American major. Mm -hmm. This is contrary to the rules that govern international warfare. Right. He said, you're not a major. I said, I am. He said, you didn't tell me before. I said, you did not. And uh, I mean, this is the way w we dealt. I'm really not teasing you very much. It's about the way it went. And so here's Ely and me, each put separately in solitary confinement. Two hours later or less, this prison commander sent a messenger over to tell me to report to his office. Office, I say, a little cubicle in, the, in this little school. We go in there and he, and he says, Major, uh, I'm about to surrender this camp to you. I said, thank you. <laughs> he said, at 3 o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to line up my forces, my, uh, which is not many men that were his prison guards and so forth, and I'm going to turn over the command of this camp to you, and I will be your prisoner. I said, thank you very much. Why should we, why should we wait till 3 o'clock? Why don't we just do it now? I said, I will take your Luger. He took it off his, his belt, and he handed me his Luger pistol, which is, if nothing else, it's the symbol of command. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sorry to say I don't have that German Luger in my possession anymore because I lost it at, in later circumstances. But he surrendered the camp to me at this time. <coughs> We had probably by this hour maybe 25 or 30 is all of Allied prisoners in there. As soon as he did so, uh, he became our prisoner. I took his office. For fun, I put him in the little doghouse that he had had me in uh, before. <laughs> when you say doghouse, what was it? I hardly remember. Not yeah. much more than a doghouse yeah. over there yeah. on the side. Just a place that was hardly big enough that you could uh, lie down and, and sleep. And uh, uh, it was a form of solitary confinement. You know, it doesn't really amount to very much. Uh, and all this is happening so fast, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference anyway, I don't think. Because uh, uh, small arms fire from the British forces uh, came uh, in our hearing within minutes of this event. Mm -hmm. and the. British Army was ap approaching this school right here and now. And here's Ely and me. He's a, I called him my adjutant at this time, meaning my assistant. And I sent Ely on t up on top of the school with a white, uh, some kind of clothing around him to be like, uh, uh, to indicate, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, that is uh, neutrality or whatnot. I've lost the word that I want. I myself went out on the street and went out and met the British forces coming in in tanks right here in the city of Tunis. <coughs> the, the British uh, commander of these forces stopped his force, got out of his tank. He turned out to be a British brigadier. Mm. Now, a British brigadier is a pretty uh, uh, impressive fellow to a 24-year-old major of the American Army. and. Uh, he came out and he said to me, this British officer commanding the, the uh, uh, British force, he said, and, uh, what are you? I said, I'm commanding the American forces in Tunis. <laughs> and he said, I didn't know we had American forces. I said, well, in effect, uh, well, sir, you learn something every day. And uh, I suppose I was a pretty... Uh, 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 I was feeling pretty good, you know, to be free here, uh, yeah. and I wasn't about to be pushed around by the Germans, or dear, I might even say from our good friends, the Brits. So I uh, told him that uh, I had the American 
and other allied forces, not more than 40 of them, but I was pleased to turn the city of Tunis over to him, and he accepted my offer. Whereupon he provided me a, a, a British uh, Land Rover, uh, like a Jeep, and gave me transportation back to General Bradley's uh, headquarters, and my African war was over. Well, why don't we uh, jump ahead to your next term of imprisonment? All right. In between, uh, I will just mention only yes. that we had to fight a campaign in Sicily. Right and then move up to uh, England to mm -hmm. prepare for the invasion of uh, Normandy. Right. And uh, that, that, of course, occurred on 6 June of 44. And the American forces, uh, under such generals as Patton and Bradley and so forth, up on the Western Front, General uh, Bradley by now had been promoted to Army Group Commander, mm -hmm. and I was signed a first army, and when the December 16th, 1944 came, uh, Hitler, you might say, or his military commanders saw fit to make the last final punch against the uh, British and American forces. They, of course, had hopes of real success, and uh, uh, this was called the Battle of the Bulge in which he gathered up all his forces and made what turns out to have been a final onslaught <coughs> which uh, preceded the end of War II. Now, when this happened on December 16, we have the Battle of Bastogne, which I was not a part of, but north of there, uh, up in the vicinity of uh, uh, Saint-Vit and uh, uh, Memory's going to get imperfect, and I'm hurrying a little bit probably too. But uh, uh, First Army found itself, uh, First United States Army, found itself being severely punished in various areas of the, uh, of the uh, large army front. We suffered uh, serious casualties, and uh, uh, some pretty bad defeat was uh, brought on to parts of 1st United States Army and the larger 12th Army Group at that time. Uh, American units, this is December, it's snowy, just like we see in Natick today. This is how, uh, the, how about how the weather was in uh, December 17 of 44. And <coughs> I was directed by my superior in First Army staff to go out and inform unit commanders of the danger of envelopment by German forces. I'm speaking now of American small units, mm -hmm. companies and battalions, not divisions, to inform these people of the dangers uh, uh, coming in be, by the attack by the German forces. I'm hurrying too much. No, take your time. And, uh, because, you see, communication has been uh, severely damaged or destroyed. So the unit commanders don't know what's going on. They don't know what danger their own unit may be in, that it may be overrun by the Germans. So we send a messenger, in this case me, to go out and inform the unit commanders what's going on so that they can take appropriate action and protect themselves. Well. When I was instructed to go out and do this on the night of December 16, this is a little aside if we have time for it, sure. I telephoned my brother Roger, uh, who was a young lieutenant in the same outfit, but uh, we only got to see each other once a week or so. I telephoned him and told him, come on over and have breakfast with me tomorrow morning, 5 a.m. I want to see you before I go out on a mission. Roger and I had breakfast together. I handed him this ring for him to take care of in my uh, absence because I wasn't sure that I was coming back. And uh, he returned it to me uh, some months later. And uh, I mentioned, mentioned that only as a little example. There is a bit of humanity in war uh, at times. And uh, so about probably 6 a.m. on the 17th after that breakfast, I took off to 
carry out my assigned mission, which was to go and, and uh, speak to uh, perhaps six or eight different unit commanders to tell them what their uh, situation was. Hardly had I be begun on this mission, S snowy roads, I'm riding in a Jeep, Starback is not my driver, who he was. he's still back in Africa. I don't remember who's my driver right now. I don't, it's perhaps it's not important now, it was then, but I don't remember his name. I don't think I was more than five miles out on my, uh, on my mission then, much the same as what had happened in Africa uh, uh, previously. My Jeep driver and I were attacked by the Germans by a small number of men with rifle fire disabling the jeep, tipping it over in the, uh, in the ditch, almost like a duplicate in a way of speaking mm -hmm. of what had happened in Africa, except this is snowy, cold, all that, big different. Germans jumped on top of it, on top of us, two or three, no, no large number of men. They kind of picked up the jeep, righted it, and put it uh, up, uh, back up on the road put me in the back seat with the, with the driver and uh, two Germans in the front seat and they started uh, driving us. We passed through a place which has become quite well known in history called Malmedy, M-A-L-M-E-D-Y. This is where the Malmedy massacre occurred at this very time and place. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I looked from the jeep, we were moving uh, slowly and cautiously, a little hard for me to draw the picture clearly of the great confusion of everything in this whole place. Here's, we're driving down this uh, uh, snowy road, I looked out in a field, it looks almost like the Natick Common, which I'm looking out as I sit here, looking out in the field, and there's 200, my estimate, 200 Americans lined up and, and the, these are captives of the Germans. I could see, it's a distance of no more than 100 yards, I could see that some small number of Americans in this group of perhaps 200 were wearing the Red Cross brassard, which would indicate that these are medics, American medics. I tapped the German driver on the shoulder and I said, I want to go and I want to join the, uh, uh, those prisoners because I'm bleeding all over my face. And all, you can see the blood coming down, very evident. I said, I want to get medical care. And the German uh, non-commissioned officer sitting there, he said, no, you cannot go there, you are wounded. Didn't make much sense, did it, Barbara? Yeah. Didn't seem to make much <laughs> sense, but it didn't make great sense because within two hours, the whole 200 were dead in the in the Maumedi massacre. So in what kind of peculiar sense it makes would be that this German is also a human and dare I say a humanitarian. He does not want this injured man, I'm, this is my speculation, he does not want this injured man to go there to be killed. Have it how you will. That's simply the recollection of 17 December. So he did not permit me any care. Incidentally, I didn't really need it anyway. The wound was not serious. It looked horrible, and it really wasn't uh, even important. By this time, I was a lieutenant colonel, and the leaf on my hel steel helmet that was worn right there, the leaf was damaged by the bullet that went through, bounced off this hard skull, and out through the back of the, oh. of the steel helmet. I wish I had it for a souvenir. Oh. I do not have. But this is a, a compliment to the uh, American uh, 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 industry that they created a helmet which would deflect the bullet and thus save the life of this particular soldier. Uh, I think that, that, that if you know something about ballistics and all, you can understand, you can design that steel helmet to make it go like it did, and this was a proof positive uh, on the ground that it worked. If I make a little joke of it, I think you could excuse me. I mean, it's, it's been a good feeling all these years to realize, and I, 
uh, don't intend to be exaggerating anything. I'm telling you as truly as I can what I believe is the case. So we went on for a little while. <clears throat> if you have questions, please interrupt me. We went on for a little while. Uh, the days are short in December. Uh, darkness would come at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And these uh, y young German soldiers were anxious to get rid of my driver and me. That is, turn us over to some larger holding uh, unit so that uh, they were not encumbered by us. We could talk more about the Maumedi massacre, but the history books can tell you about that. I will not get into it further right now. It, it has to do with a field artillery observation battalion. Uh, I would not be able to do it justice. I did not actually see it happen. I learned later that it happened, no doubt within minutes of my request to join in with that. Now, <coughs> the drivers then turned us over to a uh, some kind of a collecting point of prisoners, and I found myself now with uh, perhaps uh, 20 or 30 or 40 or so uh, American prisoners being kind of uh, gathered together along with wrecked uh, military equipment, tanks and half tracks and things. That w It was just kind of a, uh, looked like it's kind of a salvage yard. Uh, darkness was coming upon us, and uh, I was instructed by the Germans to have my men using American fuel to fill the tanks of the, to fill the tanks of the tanks and of the trucks so that the Germans could put these vehicles to work. Mm -hmm. I always tried to comply with their orders, uh, with the German orders. I felt it was my responsibility, as I've mentioned earlier, to do anything that I could to, uh, uh, shall we say, to disrupt the German efforts at all times. That's the, about the only thing a prisoner can contribute to his country. Disrupt the enemy if you can. So I told the boys, now, for each two, ga for each two cans of gasoline that you put in each tank, you're to put in one can of water. <laughs> and we thus were able to disable, them even, disable the tanks even before they would be able to move by having the mixture of water and uh, fuel in there so none of those tanks probably possibly ever moved again. Uh, just a little, kind of a little side issue that uh, if nothing else it makes you feel good to feel, well I couldn't kill a tank with a bullet but I can with water and uh, this uh, was done successfully. At a certain uh, point that same evening uh, most of the American prisoners in this group and some of them could have been other nationalities, I don't remember, uh, were marched to some next stage of prison prisoner collection. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact of my wound, I was considered to be a wounded man and therefore ought not have to walk. Fair enough with me, that's okay with me. <laughs> and so, along with a few other wounded, we were taken by truck. And here we, mo we were moved by truck. Uh, I suppose it's getting to be about December 18th, as I'm now speaking, uh, uh, moved to a place called Limburg. Sounds like cheese, doesn't it? Yes. And that's probably is what it is. And we were moved to a, a much larger collecting point of prisoners. And uh, it, uh, what I, what Mind's Eye uh, remembers now, uh, what is this, 56 uh, years later, eh? uh, we were moved to a huge barn, which was on the grounds of, a, of an ancient German castle. Here was a huge barn and uh, Incidentally, of course, Yuletide is approaching and all this, and we get to this huge barn, and it may be that there were, I'll just take a wild guess, 50 years later, maybe there were 500 uh, American and British and French prisoners in there, in this great barn. And as was so characteristic of my peculiar situation, I'm the senior American officer. Mm -hmm. Well, less than a week till Christmas, Morale is my business. We did some Christmas carols. We did other things to try to keep some degree of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, good feeling among the men while we're waiting to wonder, so what's going to be next? And here's just hundreds of people milling around in this great barn with practically none of the most basic human services that 
any kind of humanity requires, like, say, food, like, say, bandages, like all the rest of the stuff. There was just nothing much there. We were just a great lump of people. I was called upon by a, a German, turned out to be a warrant officer in the German Medical Corps. Knowing that I was a senior officer present, he called me to the prison clinic. That's what it was called. And it was uh, uh, just a little corner kind of, of this great barn. And this man, who also spoke English, a lot of the Germans spoke some English, he said to me like this. He said, I have two terribly wounded American soldiers. Their lives are useless. Normally I require, my government requires a doctor's approval before we do, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, euthanasia. Euthanasia. Mm -hmm. euthanasia. We must have doctor's approval before we do euthanasia. There are no doctors in this place. Therefore, the alternative is to get the approval of the senior American officer before I do the euthanasia. So he took me in to see these two men. They were sitting on adjacent makeshift hospital beds, some kind of cots. Their heads were bandaged. This German warrant officer of the medical corps told me that they had each had their frontal lobe shot out, both of these men. Their lives were helpless, hopeless, there's no purpose in having them live. And he asked me to approve the euthanasia. And what did you say? No way. I am not authorized to do that. Under the Geneva Convention, I have no such authority. It's your problem, mister. I mention it only as an event. Right. I have nothing to follow it with. They may have died a natural death in three days. Mm -hmm. He may have conduct, done the euthanasia anyway. We don't know. I just think it maybe adds a little something to the feel of what we're trying to tell them. It does. Mm -hmm. Within the next 24 hours, no, couldn't have been that soon. It must have been uh, longer than that, and the days are not entirely clear. But it was on the 30, on about the 26th of December, I would say, that I was ordered into solitary confinement. That is taken out of the 500 men in this barn and put over into a great castle, which uh, uh, was being used as some kind of German headquarters. I was taken to the sixth floor of this ancient castle and put all by myself in this cold stone room mm -hmm. with no instructions at all, nothing. Here I am. Mm -hmm. Days passed, one day, two days, three days, maybe four days, something like this. I have no contact with the world. Outside through the window, and there was a small window, I could hear the German troops singing Lily Marlene out there as they were having their drilling, down six floors below. It was pretty lonely, Barbara. You can imagine how cold it would be up there. No kind of heat in this thing. Nothing, no human contact of any kind, except once or perhaps twice a day. Somebody would slip a little tray of uh, uh, minimal food uh, uh, through some hole under the door, something like that, a, a bit of bread and butter, and uh, maybe something pretending to be coffee, something like that. And on December 31st was New Year's Eve. Is it that here? Sorry about go. that. Oh, that's quite right. De December 31st is, uh, are we all right? Yep. Is New Year's Eve, and a man was sent up to my uh, room, and he banged on the door, and he said, uh, in German, he spoke to me, that the commanding officer wants to see me. And he took me down six flights of uh, stairs in this uh, 
uh, chateau and across the courtyard, bare feet in the snow. And I go into this, I don't know who the commanding officer is, and I go in there and this is a German major who's in charge, uh, twice my age probably. And uh, he said, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ray, <coughs> he said, I could not think of you spending New Year's Eve all by yourself. I said, thank you very much. He said, why don't we just have our New Year's together? I said, sounds great to me. And he questioned me. This was an intelligence officer. Uh -huh. This reason for the solitary confinement was to prepare the guy mentally to be uh, 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 questioned, interviewed. Uh, I won't say even as I'm being interviewed today, but a little different, <laughs> a little different thing. This is to get for the German army to get its intelligence from this relatively high-ranking, though very youthful officer, so that they could find out more about the American forces. What did he ask you? Very interesting question. But the first thing he would ask, would you prefer Johnny Walker, or would you <laughs> rather have the other thing? Whatever it was. And he had samples of all of the finest liquors that uh, uh, Britain has ever produced. There they are all around this room, and it's he and I having a little uh, 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 New Year's Eve party. We're not very well acquainted before, but uh, uh, I know that he's already had his share already. And so I make up my mind, well, I don't mind a drink once in a while either, but I'm going to be sure he has three for every one I have. And so this was our evening. It went on for some hours. And he asked lots of different questions. My favorite question that he asked was, and who is this Iron Mike O'Daniel? And I said, well, you even know his nickname, don't you? I said, that's Major General John McDa McDaniel of the United States Army. Mm -hmm. He's the commanding general of the 3rd Infantry Division, U.S. Army. You know that, don't you? Now, mind you, I am sworn myself as an American soldier, officer, or otherwise, that I'm giving out no information. And I honor my pledge to my country. And I'm taking a little liberty, even against that vow, just between me and my army and my God and my own intellect, that I feel I can control myself and I can violate that order to a very limited degree, even though I have no such authority except, except self-given. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I come through at all. Yes, you do. I, I know that I'm doing that which is not right, but I think there's more can be done for America by just the least bit of this, do you see? So I played with this guy and uh, who's in, uh, interviewing me or interrogating me is the word I need to say. And uh, uh, he's getting kind of half cocked himself anyway. And uh, he said, what is there about this Iron Mike O'Daniel that makes him think he can walk out in front of his troops even when they're attacking the German army, that he can expose himself to the troops? What does he think he, he is? Well, he just thinks he's better than any German general, <laughs> is what I told the guy. And he's one of the greatest of our generals, Iron Mike O'Daniel. God bless his soul. This fellow went on and he told me, this went on for hours, mind you. He's doing most of the talking. He was telling me about Hitler's plan to attack New York City mm -hmm. and environs, right. including the shore of Long Island including New Jersey Shore, including some New England Shore, mm -hmm. and all of this stuff. To this day, of course, I have no way of knowing whether there was anything to the baloney he was giving me in exchange for the baloney I was giving him. <laughs> I have no way really to know, except the history books will show that at this time, in like uh, January or so of 1945, the very small elements of German forces were in fact landing on the Jersey Shore and so forth. And uh, so there, there is a certain matchup here. I found it all very, very interesting and amusing. After the clock uh, struck 
midnight, he sent me back up to the sixth floor and the uh, interrogation was over. I think I can tell Barbara today he got no valuable information from me. At the same time, I'm not authorizing future American soldiers to go as far as I did in my speaking. I hope it gets through all right. Can we backtrack a little? Could you tell me what Christmas Day was like? <laughs> well, I don't think I can sort it out from the other day. The whole thing was the spirit of Christmas, and believe me, the young American soldier, uh, uh, he cares about Christmas, and uh, he celebrates it wherever he is. Yeah. We did a certain amount of, calorie, uh, of caroling, and I know you'd like to know more about food, but I, uh, there was probably so little of it, there's nothing to remember. Uh, really, when you take 500 guys in a barn and there's no kind of service at all, the chances are we were, were, weren't fed anything much. There may have been some uh, great hunk of sausage that was tossed out to be uh, divided among uh, 20 men or something like this, uh, but it would be nothing much worth saying. I, I think it's fair to repeat that the uh, morale of our men is so important to their senior officers as well as to themselves, that we did everything we could to keep men healthy and happy without food and without any medicine and without any doctors. We did all those things trying to keep warm also, and we just used our best judgment to keep people. There's always a danger, of course. You could have psychiatric problems that could be very serious, and it's these that we're trying to uh, 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 ward off by uh, trying to keep people happy. A lot of joke telling. Mm -hmm a lot of, uh, very little incidentally, of kind of recrimination by anybody about anything. Nothing like my commander was stupid to get his whatever, nothing yeah. like that. Uh, I think we were all in very good spirit. As an officer, what sorts of things did you do to keep, help your troops stay warmer or get more food? <coughs> We're still in a very transit, trans, transient situation. Mm -hmm. We know we're all going to be here as quick as a train will come and, and load us up. We move on to something more permanent. Everything we've described thus far, whether in the African camps or even now in Germany, is very transitory. We haven't really got to a prison camp yet, you understand. And you, you, you just don't know whether the train is going to come by or truck or marching on foot uh, uh, within the next hour or tomorrow or the next day. It's one of the horrible things about this uh, situation is you just don't know what's up. And you can't blame the enemy, the detaining power, that they don't give high priority to our comfort or anything like that. They've got a war from their point of view. They've got a war to win, right? And we're just a, 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 an albatross, if that's maybe what I should say, around their neck. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to be responsible for 500 prisoners. It's just a pain in the neck mm -hmm. for them, from their point of view. Well, after a while, uh, I think we moved by truck. And I found myself, it was partly on foot too. I, I can't sort it out real clearly. I do remember marching on foot into the city of Bonn. Mm -hmm. And after a while, we were put into what would be called a Stalag. The Stalag being a, a shall we say, an organized prison camp. Right. Finally, at the town of Hamelburg. Hamelburg. It has become a little bit famous since then because of the breakout from Hamelburg, which means the escape from Hamelburg. Uh, which occurred. That is a whole chapter, whether we're going to have time for it today, I don't know how much of that you may want. I was a senior officer in Hamelburg. By now I had about 1,700 prisoners, of which I was the senior person. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, probably sounds awful for me to keep saying this senior thing, but it, it suggests something about my own responsibilities in this thing. It is to keep my men healthy and fit and, uh, and happy as I can possibly do and safe and to encourage escape 
and all things that are, that are to their benefit. Mm -hmm. And to be accomplishing these things is necessarily to be rebellious myself against the detaining power. Mm -hmm. This is how I see my position in it. Incidentally, nobody ever trained me for this kind of thing. But <laughs> On the job. <coughs> we had about 1,700 men, mostly very young, mostly younger than I. May seem hard to believe. A whole bunch of, this was mostly officers, incidentally, in there. Lots of infantry lieutenants were in there. <coughs> like that. Well, and better organized than anything we've talked about before in the sense that there was a mess hall situation. There was a clinic situation. Mind you, so poor, so terrible, that it's, it's almost wrong to uh, bless them with the names that I've given them. But <coughs> our, our fare was uh, food was very, very little. It's the same things I've mentioned from the other camps before, this black bread with the sediment stuff in the bottom, something that uh, resembled apple butter but really was made from beets. Try it sometime, Barbara. <laughs> Beet butter. You can do it. You can make it. Uh, and we had coffee, I insist, that was made from acorns. Maybe it'll turn out it was chestnuts instead. I called it acorn. We had, uh, we were in uh, flimsy wooden barrack buildings without any real heating facility in them at all. <coughs> and it's still uh, getting to be January. We're into January now. It's really cold up in there in those days. Well, we did not have very much sickness. Everybody's losing weight, but we managed to keep a, a degree. This is part of my responsibility, is to see that men do exercise. Don't just allow themselves to kind of uh, fall apart and rot on the vine, as it were. They must be encouraged and taught and urged and insisted that they treat each other decently and properly and not be angry about the situation we're in. Uh, I, I found it a kind of uh, uh, an inspiring responsibility that uh, I had and I had men to help me. Incidentally, in my own uh, living situation, I lived with four American medics. There was Major Serbs, he was a ch chest surgeon. And here was Captain Fisher, he was an internist. And here was uh, Captain Galvin, he was a uh, pulmonary fellow. And these were my, I called them my roommates. I called them my medical staff. <laughs> and when I told those fellows about those uh, men with their frontal lobes shot out about it, I said to Charlie Serbs, what do you think I should have done? What would you, Charlie, I said, what would you do with a man that has front lobe shut out? And Charlie Serb said, I would transfer him to the regular Army Medical Corps. That was a form of very dry, yes. mean humor yeah. by Charlie Serbs, my friend, the <laughs> chest surgeon. He was, he was, this was a, a, a civilian uh, yes. physician, you see, who's come into the Army, and he's saying, if he's got no brains left, Put him in the Army Medical Corps. He was, he was my good friend though <laughs> and they were good helpers and they helped me to keep these men in uh, uh, these uh, 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 prisoners in some kind of good help. Was it, it, uh, there were lots of interesting things about this life, believe me. What was your day-to-day -day contact with the prisoners? You were uh, separated somewhat because you were an officer. Oh no, no, what was no, your... no, no. There was no separation. Yeah. We were almost all Almost all of the officers in this Stalag in Hamelberg, mm -hmm. almost all of the prisoners were officers. Okay. Almost all. Now, just down the block, a very short distance, was a separate compound where enlisted men were. So You're quite right. It was the German policy to keep the enlisted men separated from the officers. And they did it by having separate camps. So, so on a day-to-day -day basis, what sort of communications did you have with the lower-ranking officers to, to improve the morale and to get them to exercise? Were you oh, well, we, we all lived together in the very gross, uh, I mean, what contact, heck, you, you, you met them, <laughs> you did everything together. It's uh, hard to figure out how to say that. Let's say that a, that a, a, 
a flimsy barracks building perhaps could house a hundred men. Well, there we were, and just happened that uh, you'd probably congregate with men that you had something in common with, perhaps age in my case. I chose to associate with these medical officers. They were a little bit more uh, educated and a little older than I was. We had our four or five bunks over here. Over here were a bunch of young second lieutenants, maybe, whatnot. It was not very organized. I wonder if I'm coming through. You are. Uh, it's just my... Uh, <coughs> so, so we, but we're in daily contact mm -hmm. with 1,700 people in one place uh, for a month or two. Uh, I can only get to know a certain limited number of them, really. I, 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 you know, it's just normal human relations, how many you... Uh, and yet, I had responsibility for all. I think maybe I see what you're driving about. Did I have, did I delegate some authority here mm -hmm. to others and possibly uh, have it like in platoons or something like that? And now that you mention it, I guess I probably did. I, I didn't uh, exactly think of it that way. I didn't think of, that, of them as being comp company commanders or platoon leaders or something, but we were in constant contact all the time. The guys, got, they'd get cold, with me too. Everybody, get, you know, being a lieutenant colonel doesn't keep you warm. <laughs> and you don't have any food. And they wouldn't give us anything. There was some kind of little stove in each barracks, but nothing to burn in it. Right. <coughs> you know, this stuff is... Uh, sorry. That's quite all right. It's your silk shirt. All right. That's from China. Well. Let me explain. Adjoining our camp was the Serbs, the Yugoslavs. Mm -hmm. In the modern day, we think of them in terms of ethnic cleansing. And these guys whom today's press has made the ethnic cleansers were my bosom buddies mm -hmm. across through the wire. These guys had been prisoners for six and a half years. I for a month or two. Six and a half years these prisoners of Hitler had been in there. Big mustaches, tough fellows, and my loving friends. And these guys would give me a half a cigarette or a cigarette butt, or sometimes on a good day, two cigarettes. And it leads to all other kinds of stuff. We really don't have time to get into all this stuff, I'm sure. Where'd they get the cigarettes? They stole them from the Germans. Yeah. They taught me how to do the stealing from the Germans so that I could teach my men how to do things like that. <laughs> These guys, they worked out of the German potato fields, whatnot, and they, they were able to, to smuggle back into their camp the German potatoes. And then finally, after Lieutenant Mihail Anjelkovic and I became pretty well acquainted. Day after day, he's giving me one cigarette. I'm clean now, Barbara, I don't smoke anymore. <laughs> but in those days, I did. And he said one day, after we'd known each other for a week or two, I think you should meet our commanding officer. I said, I'd be honored to. What is his name? He said, his name is Rodmilo Trojanovich, Lieutenant Colonel, Yugoslav Army. Six and a half years prisoner. Mm. He requests to meet you on the coming Thursday night after dark. How should we do that? They said, we will take care of it. Mm -hmm. Thursday night come, they had cut a hole in the barbed wire. John Ray goes through this <laughs> wire on into the Yugoslav camp after dark. As he does so, saying to himself, is this a trap? What have you bought yourself into, mister? And into this dark building and on up into there. And at the, at the top of the ramp, there was Lieutenant Colonel Rodmilo Trojanovich, dressed in the full dress uniform of the Yugoslav army. The red tabs, the this, the that, the what not and a handsome officer who later became my good friend because every Thursday thereafter 
his Serbian soldiers made a hole in that wire so that Lieutenant Colonel Ray oh. could go and have his weekly meeting with Lieutenant Colonel Trojanovic. And what did you talk about? How did we talk? Do I speak Yugoslav? No way. Well, we did it in French. We did it in the French language. And a formal dinner was served each Thursday evening for Radmilo and John. And the dinner was all stolen food from the Germans. It was potatoes, mashed potatoes in great heaps. <laughs> Poured over the top was some kind of salmon, uh, uh, cream salmon kind of thing that made it really a banquet. And with it was the Slibovich, which is the outstanding uh, uh, national drink of the Yugoslavs. And we had a nice part nice party each Thursday evening, uh, including music from uh, Trian Trojanovich's little orchestra that he had in there. <laughs> These guys have had six and a half years of beating up on the Germans while being the prisoners of the Germans. And he, and he would teach me how we could survive. He would uh, give me information. It, it's, it's too much uh, wonderful stuff for me to try to tell you the whole thing, Barbara. Years later, in 1950, I'm at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. A telegram comes to me at Fort Sill, Oklahoma from the State Department of the United States of America. I'm a student in the artillery school at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Telegram says from the State Department, addressed to Colonel Ray, you have been given as a reference in the request for immigration to the United States of America of Radmilo Trojanovic. You are requested to uh, fill out the following form about the, uh, about the uh, uh, appropriateness that he should become an American citizen or should be allowed to immigrate to America. I received this at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, five years after uh, our having earlier met. And I went home, met my wife at my home that evening, and I said to her, Look at the telegram I have received. I don't know what I should do. I'm asked, is he qualified to be an American citizen? And before she could even answer me, I said, sweetheart, I already know the answer. And I authorized his coming to America. And it was 10 years thereafter that I met Radmilo Trojanovic in Washington where he had taken unto himself an American bride in Baltimore, had been employed by the United States Army Corps of Engineers as an expert map maker for use by the Army Map Service with particular emphasis on maps for Eastern Europe. This man was of the very upscale uh, intelligentsia of Yugoslavia. He was tutor for King Peter of Yugoslavia before your time. And a most distinguished and loving friend. And he and his men, or perhaps their grandchildren, have somewhere or other in today's press or last year's press come into a situation. I'm getting a little outside okay. of the prison business, but uh, you say, what did we talk about? We had just grand time, and I think he helped me to uh, uh, save my men. When, uh, getting back to uh, Hamelberg, what, what sustained you uh, in your own moments? I know you helped improve the morale of the men, but what sustained you? Well, <laughs> I suppose it's a fair question, but I think you probably have the same in you as I have. Your love of your country, of fellow man, of your army, and the confidence and the success. I'm a Republican, but I had confidence in Franklin Roosevelt. 
who died even as we were in the Hamelberg prison on the 12th of April 1945. We knew what we were doing, and I mean, you have to be positive to fight a war, whichever side of the, of the camp you may be on, I believe. I, I, I've never been faced with that question before. It's, it, I, I think, maybe lifelong training. I'll tell you what, these fellows whose picture I brought you, they sustained me. Omar Bradley sustained me. Mm -hmm. Martin Ray, my father, sustained me. There's the fella. He received nine telegrams during that war. Martin Ray did. I brought one for you, but I don't think you want it now. That's when he received word in May of 1945 of my successful release and coming home. But so let's go back to your Himmelberg yeah. and your uh, the time between that you were talking about visiting the uh, Yugoslav officer and the time that you were released. What happened? Well, in late March, my calendar isn't too good. I'm either in March or April, and I, I think, I guess it's, it must be April. This camp was augmented by uh, the arrival of uh, two or three hundred more Americans marching across from Poland where the Russian forces at this time in 1945 were forcing the Germans back and thus the imprisoned Americans in Poland had to be moved out of there uh, or they would have fallen to the Russians and the Germans would have lost. So that the German camps in Poland, the people in those camps had to be brought back to the West. I'm going to take a real liberty. You may not like it. You may want to cut it out of here. But we describe the German situation as trying to put two pounds of shit in a one pound bag. <laughs> this is the problem that they were faced with. Yes. You probably want to expunge that from this report. But in any event, that's the way we said it. <clears throat> Something like 200 Americans marched across in the snow from Poland to Hamelburg. These were led by Colonel Paul R. Good, Pop Good, a well-known great old soldier of the, and the, probably the oldest prisoner that America lost in Europe, I would think. And Pop Good and Lieutenant Colonel John K. Waters and others marched across from Poland. And this young Lieutenant Colonel was uh, 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 unfrocked, is that what we want? <laughs> He's no longer the senior American officer. Pop Good took over with yeah. John Water. Well, <coughs> and that is a senior officer. Here's a whole other great story. You know? The Germans thought he was nuts. They thought he was, uh, what do we call it these days, like, uh, you know, senile or, you got other words for it today. Anyway, uh, and he was about as senile as a, as a fox, Pop Good was. First order he put out when he came over and dispossessed me as the senior officer was, there'll be no more escapes from Hamelburg, except with my personal approval. No American is to even try to escape without my personal approval. Well, now the young lieutenants are all excited. He won't even allow us to escape. This is a terrible dictatorship. I am convinced today, although I don't know anybody who can verify what I'm about to tell you. Pop Good carried bagpipes all over as he marched across from Poland. The Germans, I tell you, thought he was senile. He was, as I say, about as senile as a fox. I am convinced, he never told me, but I am convinced that in the bagpipes was radio communication to, present, to General Eisenhower's headquarters. Today I am convinced of that. Yeah. I am, have no way to prove the truth. And the reason he carried his bagpipes was so that he could communicate with uh, uh, Shafe headquarters, Supreme Headquarters Allied Forces, uh, uh, constantly, without the German knowledge. Foxy Grandpa. <laughs> and the idea was he would instruct the men, you must not try to escape without my personal permission. 
and being in contact, constant contact with uh, Eisenhower's headquarters, he could tell when the time to do so was ripe and when it was dangerous. Mm -hmm in varying degrees. We can't get into all of the kind of thing at this time, but it seemed like a horrible dictatorship, but there it was. All of a sudden, sometime in April, I don't know the dates, gunfire outside the Hamelberg camp. Small arms fire. Mm -hmm. Tanks approaching, busted through American tanks, busted through the wire of Hamelberg. Mm -hmm. Captain Baum of Brooklyn, New York, B-A-U-M, was leading this uh, small task force of about 30 uh, armored vehicles, that is tanks and half-tracks, busted into the camp. Our men went wild, our 1,700 men went absolutely, couldn't believe the excitement of all. Every, nobody knows what's going on, what's here, where they come from, but by golly, they're American. How did you feel? Very excited and also very ignorant. What is going on? That's all moving very, very fast. Yeah. Well, I mentioned John K. Waters, Lieutenant Colonel, kind of deputy to Pop Good, and John K. Waters unfurled an American flag, uh. which he had to have somewhere. I don't know where. He had it, <laughs> and he marched out with a small little honor guard around him, right. marched out to meet Captain Baum and his forces. I had known Lieutenant Colonel Waters long ago, like uh, when he was a tactical officer at West Point, and later on I was to get to know him until the time of his death 50 years later. Uh, that's John K. Waters. Now it happens he was son-in-law of George Patton. Uh. His wife, Beatrice, Waters was Beatrice Patton. Of all the family I've known fairly well through the years. Pre-war I used to ride to the hounds with Mrs. Patton mm -hmm. at Fort Benning, Georgia, long years before, in the days of my horsey army. Mm -hmm. And yet not so many days before we're talking about really only five years. Up. So John Waters marched out there to meet Captain Baum. And a German rifleman shot John Waters in the back. And John Ray and two or three others got hold of a litter and picked up John Waters. He was a lieutenant colonel, uh, you might say for real, like a half a generation older than I. And we put him on this stretcher and took him to the camp clinic which was run by I've forgotten the doctor's name a Yugoslav doctor mm -hmm. was our uh, total medical force in this camp and this Yugoslav doctor saved the life of John Waters who went on to live a full and productive oh. life and eventually reached four-star rank in the United States yeah. Army after the Korean War and all these other things. There's so many things to yeah. try to crowd in here. It's a little hard to. I carried him to the clinic along with others. Having got him there safely and under the care of this medical officer, then the, uh, I and uh, most of the rest went out and joined Captain Baum's task force in which they would lead us and help us back to the American lines, which were 60 miles away. Unfortunately, it was a failure. Within about an hour, we were attacked by a German force, which reduced the effectiveness, if we had any, of our little tank force. Mind you, we 1,700 men were a burden to Captain Baum. We were no good to really help him as fighters. We had no weapon, not much strength, not much of anything else. But in any event, this is a whole story in itself. I've got 30 different reports of what happened home in my, in my house here right now. Uh, you, you, you're welcome to look or copy. 30 different men's observation on what happened that day, all nicely written up about th this particular day of the breakout. Well. <clears throat> Pop Good, a very distinguished infantry uh, uh, colonel himself, infantry leader, he informed us all at about dusk that evening that 
he gave us three choices. Each of you, 1,700 men, you've got three choices. Make it on your own back to the American forces and get out of Captain Baum's way. Mm -hmm. Number two, if you have a weapon and if you have help, and if Captain Baum wants you, become a part of his crew. Mm -hmm. Not many had any weapon or anything. Number three, return with me to the Hamelberg camp, Pop Good said, Colonel Good. I chose that last alternative. I think it was the correct choice. Today, I think so. Maybe how come I'm here? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I commend my fellows who made the other choices. Whatever, everybody did their best. It was a hell of a day. And we all went back to the camp. <coughs> you might say we, we restored German leadership to our camp. And we were all like, kind of ashamed of ourselves in a way of speaking, but uh, that's just the way it was. How did the Germans treat you when you returned? Uh, well, they, uh, <laughs> they were in such confusion themselves. Uh, the, the, there was not enough organization. I think I get the feel of what you're asking. There was not enough organization among them that they had any kind of program to punish anything like this. They themselves had become a nothing, you see, only a few hours before. And we were soon loaded, the entire outfit was soon loaded aboard trains to go to Nuremberg. I don't know the distance. Mm -hmm. To Nuremberg. And here were these boxcars. This probably was the following day. Boxcars. You've heard from World War I probably when they were called by the American forces in World War I, the 40 and 8s. It meant a boxcar can carry 40 men or eight horses. Right. That's why they were called 40 of a 40 hommes, 8 chevaux. 40 men or eight horses. And so you crammed all the guys in there. I'm sure if they were made to carry 40 men, they stuffed 80 of us probably into a, a, a boxcar and uh, uh, no food, no light, no air. No, nothing like there. And at the last minute, they throw in one big sausage, no knife, no way to do, divide it up among yourselves. Just another little minor experience in the whole thing. Then we go down the tracks some distance. The uh, train is attacked from the air, no doubt by American bombers. And uh, we're unloaded and uh, loaded back in again. And on it goes, almost becomes kind of repetitive. I can't uh, like recall each uh, day and hour of all these things. We are finally taken down to Nuremberg, uh, which if I recall, was my final, shall we say, prisoner resting place. And there's Pop Good. <laughs> He's there. And by now it is May. Fifth, I think, my birthday is May 3rd, and it was two days after, I think, was May 5th, which may be honored some way or other as being a VE day or an early VE day or whatever it was. And there's Pop Good. And he called all of his senior officers into a room. By senior, meaning everybody higher than maybe a captain. It wasn't a great many. He may have had about 40 of us, something like that. And here's what Pop Good had to say. He said, I am now in command. The German Major General has surrendered the whole damn thing uh. to me. Something like 150,000 prisoners. Uh. Somewhere the numbers may be more accurate than I can give you. Some huge number, like a pretty good sized city of 150,000 prisoners that Pop Good is responsible for now. The German Major General has surrendered. Pop chooses his 40 senior people, some Brits, some American, some French, and he says, and you gentlemen will be my brigade commanders and my regimental commanders and my battalion commanders. And each of you whom I designated brigade commander, probably it was a small number of full colonels that were in there. He made them brigade commanders. You will each command uh, maybe 10,000 prisoners. And you'll have as your subordinates, you know, the lieutenant colonels and the majors and the captains like this. Now. 
And at my level of like Lieutenant Colonel, you'll have 5,000. And the rules are rather simple. You will return to your home country as soon as you have properly distributed your 5,000 to their home countries. Get the feel of it? He has 150,000 men, a small number of people. All the questions could arise in your mind about hospitalization and this and that and food and water and all the rest, transportation. <laughs> we know that, what's it look like? Three months is it gonna take us to get this done? Four months, five months, two months? What's it gonna be? Knock on the door. Pop Good says, enter. Mm -hmm. And in comes my friend Major Al Gar. G-A-R-R. -R. Mm -hmm. And Al was my assistant before ever I was captured back in, the, back in Belgium. Mm -hmm. and Al Gar all dressed up, spit and polish and all fine. He salutes Pop Good, he says, Major Gar, reporting to Colonel Good, as directed by Supreme Headquarters. And Pop says, and what is your mission? And Major Gar says, I have this message for you, uh, Colonel Good. And Pop Good opened the message, which read, I wish I had a copy of it. I do not. Colonel Good. Kindly release to the bearer, Lieutenant Colonel John Ray, for uh, 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 movement to Headquarters First Army. Pop looked at me. <laughs> you son of a gun. Pop turns to Major Gar and he said, somebody, get the devil out of here. <laughs> Off we go. And there was Major Gar. He had a La Salle limousine. In your time, you may or may not remember La Salle, but the next brother of Cadillac in American fine limousines of the days back in the 1930s and 40s was La Salle. Mm -hmm. And so Major Gar had a beat up old La Salle limousine which had been captured from the Germans, no less. And so Al took me by this limousine to the headquarters of the commanding general of First Army, which was Courtney, Courtney Hodges, was by then the commander of First Army. And to this day, I have never been told exactly who signed the message, whether it was Omar Bradley or whether it was Dwight Eisenhower, I do not know. But at least I did not have to dispose of those five thousand poor son of a gun that had to be uh, returned to their countries and to their things and God bless them all. I think they made it, most of them, some overate so soon as to kill themselves by overeating. Uh. Some small number, I don't know, one thing, but uh, I don't know. What's next? Well. What's next is, I think I want you to, uh, we've really covered your prisoner of war experience. I want to remind anyone who's listening that we have four other tapes on your lengthy experience. I wanted to know if you have any final words from anyone on your experiences of, of being a prisoner of war. Well, I think, number one, that the mere fact of being taken pr prisoner, there's no heroism in most cases mm -hmm. to the fact of being taken. Most anyone in this circumstance probably had the alternative of death, although that's not always the case. I just want to make that clear. We, the mere fact a guy was a prisoner, you don't say right off the bat that makes him a hero. <clears throat> now I think that heroism can occur during the imprisonment. And I'm thinking, incidentally, not of my imprisonment. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the much more severe ones that Americans of my lifetime have gone through. Especially, I'll mention Senator John McCain, 
U.S. Navy, who did five and a half years of prison in Vietnam. I, especially, I will mention, my contemporaries and my colleagues in the Bataan Death March in the Philippines, terribly punished by the Japanese. The things that I have described here could not have occurred in Japanese prison camps because our German captors, bad as they were, did, I believe, try to obey the laws of war and the Geneva Convention. I have all respect, obviously, for uh, all of the other terrible things they may have done, but I think that there was a professional respect for the prisoners that even today we should honor. So I think that there, there can be a, a very fine performance by prisoners in taking care of one another. After all, each is a life which, if we can ever get it back home, can come back and fight another day. Here's one who did. And so it's a contribution to our country to be able to help each other to remain healthy and to return. I think also, as I have uh, indicated one way or another, I think it's our responsibility as prisoner to do as much damage to the enemy, dare I say, without killing myself, as I can do. We did more than I've told you about of, in lots of different ways, wasting German materials and, and uh, causing them to have to commit more of their troops to caring for us. Uh, this kind of thing weakens the German army, or at least I thought so. I know it did. I think that the, the help that one man, and nowadays forces, we have women too, might have been more fun in prison, I suppose. We didn't have any of those in those days. But uh, it, 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 I suppose, it, I don't know how that'll work in the future. But uh, uh, I only mean to say that uh, I made some very good friendships in prison, and we were able to help each other in lots of ways. I mentioned having, I believe, uh, medical officers in with me. I also had quite a few chaplains in there and quite a few Red Cross civilians were in there. And we kind of put together a jury rig sort of a, a, a Rube Goldberg kind of an organization that still had quite a lot of fun. I can remember uh, one of my fellow prisoners, an Italian boy from uh, Syracuse, would lie on his bunk reciting his mother's recipe for chicken cacciatore. <laughs> that was how he kept himself right. uh, happy. <laughs> Uh, uh, other nice things. We all made bets about the time of Franklin Roosevelt's death. We made bets among ourselves as when this damn thing is going to get over with, this war. Would you believe I won the bet? Oh. And what was the pay when it was all through? Bill Zeller and Lucille, his uh, wife, came all the way from California to New York a few weeks uh, after we were released from this whole war. We met in New York City. This was the agreed, uh, the, the bet. And they would pay all the bills for Tova, my wife, and me. We, we were not married. We were courting in those days. Pay all the bills for a weekend in New York City. Oh. It was fun like that, you know, and I met uh, a, a, a few timeless uh, friendships came out of this. And, uh, but I, I also think that it has affected the entire rest of my life ever since. And I venture many other persons would agree about this. Appreciation of what? Freedom. And humanity. And the blessings. Especially in America, but also in other countries. Right. How we have and how important. We must protect those for our future. Well, I want to thank you very much for spending time uh, with us for the fifth time we've asked you to come in here. And it's really been an honor to be able to interview you. And I want to thank you very much for coming Thank you, in. Barbara. And it's been a privilege for me. Oh, I hope that uh, Natick has get some benefit. Yeah, oh, certainly. <laughs>